Minister for Health. And can advise members that question number six has been withdrawn. And I call Jerry Kelly. Question one, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The latest coronavirus related health inequalities report uh, was published by my department on the 16th of December 2020. And that showed that the hospital admission rate for COVID 19 confirmed cases in the 10 most deprived areas was more than double the rate in the 10 least, 10% least deprived areas. However, while deprivation was found to be an important factor of the likelihood of hospital admissions, age was found to be actually a greater factor. The pandemic has not uh, exacerbated existing inequalities, uh, has, has, sorry, has no doubt exacerbated existing inequalities, and therefore my department with the PHA continues to deliver a range of actions to address the impact of COVID-19 and other health conditions and behaviours on the most deprived communities and reduce health inequalities. In April 2020, the Health Improvement Division in the Public Health Agency established a regional group to oversee recovery of health improvement services throughout the first surge period um, of the pandemic. Additionally, the Test Trace Protect contact tracing service operated by the PHA also seeks to provide advice and support to those who need additional help and to help uh, people to isolate as required as when they have a positive test. The service also works closely with health improvement colleagues in the Department of Communities to address any health inequalities in terms of case identified through contact tracing or as part of an ongoing management of clusters who may face particular challenges with self-isolation. I call Jerry Kelly for something. I go on biggest lesson I'll had a fragger go Shaw. Thank you, Minister, for his answer up the uh, the uh, detail that was in it. Um, Minister, the executive decisions on the introduction of restrictions and any restrictions, uh, any decisions to lift or ease current restrictions must be firmly based on medical and scientific uh, advice and evidence. Uh, can you tell us if the medical and scientific advice from the Chief Medical Officer and the Interim Chief Scientific Advisor on the phased reopening of schools has changed since last Thursday? Um, in, in regard, it's, I suppose it has taken a step from, from the initial um, the initial question. Uh, I'm not aware of any advice having changed as to what was provided either to my department or to the executive. I call Christopher Stelford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's a well-known expression that advisers advise whilst ministers decide. But when those advisers choose to take on a very public-facing role, it is legitimate to question the advice that's being given. In that vein, why is Professor Whitty wrong about school opening, but Dr. McBride right? Um, I, I think the member in his opening comments is correct. Ministers decide, um, not, a, not a single minister. In regards to, to uh, Professor Swatty's comments, um, I think there, there seem to be some grounds in believing that actually they have been misquoted. Uh, there was, in principle, a reference to a joint CMO statement that was issued last August and September uh, on the returns from to, to schools. Uh, in that statement, Professor Whitty also made clear that a return to school is the best option from the child's point of view, and that surely never has been in dispute. Uh, the issue is what schools being open means for wider society and the health service in terms of fueling transmission. Uh, the Minister of Education brought a paper uh, to the executive uh, last week, which included two options. Uh, the one, second one, was which the one was adopted by the entirety of the executive unanimously, because the executive did not divide. Uh, on the current stance that we have. I call Matthew to uh, Deputy Speaker, um, uh, Minister, my constituency, South Belfast, is the most diverse in Northern Ireland. It's probably the most diverse in the whole island of Ireland. We also know that there's evidence, particularly from uh, GB that, um, uh, and in North America as well, that COVID has a disproportionate impact on black and minority ethnic communities. Can I ask what he and his department are doing? to uh, speak to that community to, to ensure they have maximum information and support in navigating their way through um, uh, this pandemic? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question, because I, th I think the, 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 the comment is actually timely. Um, yesterday afternoon, the, the two junior ministers, uh, myself and the chief medical officer, met with a group of ethnic minority groups, including our faith-based groups. And one of the things that came forward from especially the ethnic groups was not to um, I suppose uh, contain them with the same information that's coming out of, of GB as well in regards to access to 
to services access to information, also to access to, to the vaccine. They wanted to be very clear that there, was, there seemed to be two different narratives, and the support and the uptake of vaccines, especially in Northern Ireland, was, if not more, than their counterparts across the water, uh, than actually uh, the Caucasian, shall we say, uh, population in Northern Ireland, because of the work that they have been doing, uh, supported by the Public Health Agency and a number of other agencies who have engaged um, with the key stakeholders through the Regional Travellers Forum and the Regional Minority Ethnic and Migrants Advisory Group as well. So that information has been disseminated uh, over the period um, of, of this pandemic. I call Colin Gilden you. Uh, last can call you. Minister, given your uh, acknowledgement that the pandemic will have exacerbated inequalities, does that not suggest that the Department needs to be implementing full EQIA assessments rather than high-level screening? Um, I, I think, uh, and the member if he refers to the regulations and the change of regulations that are being brought forward at the pace that they move at, at the changes that are made, it's, it's not possible to make those full full comments and those full equality impact assessments on the change of regulations. I do know he has raised the question. Order. I do know he has raised the question on the budget in regards to that as well, but in regards to the size of my department and the timeliness uh, and the lack of time that we've actually had to bring that forward uh, in regards to public consultation, it hasn't been able to make a full equality impact assessment on all the detail, but it has been done at high level, as the member will be aware as chair of the committee, because I think that's what my officials provided in the briefing last week. Moving on, I call Keith Buchanan. Question two, please. Um, I, I thank the member again um, for, for his support. And we all owe our health and social care workers a great deal for their exceptional efforts, which have been over and beyond which one could normally expect to see. And I know that some health and social care trusts had, during the initial period of the pandemic, provided free uh, childcare um, or childcare free of charge on an interim basis to key workers. Uh, this is to be commended. Those trusts continue to be supportive of staff in relation to their childcare needs and have been actively encouraging staff to use the different flexible working options available to them, including utilising their local schools who are providing care during the day for children of key workers. But following the recent surge in COVID-19 cases and the need for a further lockdown since uh, the start of January 2021 uh, with school closures, there are a small number of cases of HSC staff whose childminders have ceased and or their working hours have changed. Where after school clubs have closed or they can no longer access informal childcare arrangements. In these instances, any additional costs, and I will stress additional costs for childcare, which have been legitimately incurred by health and social care workers as a result of the pandemic, will be reimbursed. My officials, along with the trusts, HR and finance colleagues, have been exploring a range of options uh, regarding funding for additional childcare costs in these circumstances and the resultant tax implications um, given it is seen by HMRC uh, actually as a taxable benefit, uh, and we hope to have these issues resolved as quickly as possible. I call Keith Buchanan. Minister, first response so far. Minister, can you confirm to me that the Northern Trust is aware of that information because they received a uh, communication from a constituent based on the 18th of June email to say that obviously the Department of Health was bringing the support out to the Northern Trust or uh, people who work in the Northern Trust, but as of yet, that lady has not been communicated with, or indeed the Trust is not aware of it, and I have had several com communications with them. Um, I thank the member if he's willing to share that information with me in my private office. I'll follow up. If he said the 18th of June, uh, this additional support is actually in free this wave of the pandemic for that additional support during, during what is this, this ex extra piece of work and the extra pressures that's putting on our health and social care staff. So certainly if the member wants to forward that detail to me and I'll make sure that all trusts are aware of the answer I've given to the member as well. I call Nicola Brogan. Garby, I'll get last can Corla. Minister, as you've said, um, childcare is a pressing issue for many families at the moment, in particular um, for key workers who are unable to work from home. Can you outline what plans the department has to continue this scheme into the next financial year, please? Um, thank you. As the member said, you know, childcare availability in the, in the pandemic was one of the key actions and has continued to, to function in Northern Ireland since the start 
of the pandemic, although a limited way, initial access was restricted to vulnerable children and, as the member says, those children of, of key workers as well. So that provision of the support for additional costs, and ex additional costs above normal childcare costs, will be re reimbursed both through, by, by the Trust and through Worgan um, with ourselves, the HSC Trusts, HR Finance uh, and Finance colleagues in the department, so that any uh, funding for additional childcare in these circumstances uh, will be covered, but also to be aware of the resultant tax implications, as it will be seen as a, a taxable benefit by HMRC. I call Justin McNulty. Can the Minister give us an update on the, his recent announcement of the £500 payment to NH, NHS staff and when he envisages all payments to have been made? Um, I thank the Member, and I, I am on record uh, as to the value I place on the skill dedication uh, and hard work of the health and social care staff. And I've seen firsthand the magnificent job that all, all health and social care workers perform, the risks that they take and the sacrifices that they make. And this has never been more evident than now in dealing with, with COVID-19. Uh, my officials are finalising the details of the special recognition payment uh, and answers are available to frequent, frequently asked questions are also available on my department's uh, website. Uh, it is uh, highly unlikely that that payment will be made within this financial year, but we will process it as quickly as possible because it does cover uh, a large section of the workforce, not just our own, but also additional workforces as well, which we have acknowledged will receive part of uh, on our subsequent all of the payment. I now call Patsy McLoone. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number three. And again, I, I thank the member. I recognise that for many people living with dementia, and their families the past 12 months have been extremely challenging. Many people living with dementia will have other significant health vulnerabilities and needs that, take pla that, that place them at particular risk from the COVID-19 virus. Monitoring is particularly important for individuals with dementia who may be less able to report symptoms because of communication difficulties. Members have been put in place to provide, uh, measures have been put in place to provide protection against the virus for people living with dementia, either in their own homes or in a care home setting. The protection includes the appropriate application of infection prevention and control measures, such as the, the use of appropriate PPE by care staff, the introduction of social distancing wherever possible, and the suspension of most visiting within care homes where there has been a COVID-19 outbreak. A number of regional supports have been made available to care homes with dementia units, including staffing and financial support, and on a regional and trust basis. The provision of extra training and education sessions related to supporting dementia residents and care staff. The aim of this being to understand and respond to changes in behaviour in people with dementia during the COVID-19 pandemic. People living with dementia who, who are in receipt of residential and nursing home care were also among the top priority groups for the first round of vaccinations. I call Patson Glow. Thank the Minister very much for, for his answer. Um, Minister, just given that NISRA has published evidence confirming that over 36 per cent of those who died with coronavirus uh, from March to September, also had dementia. Uh, will you be in a position, or are you in a position, to commit to making dementia a standalone priority in the department's ongoing reform of adult social care as we look forward to building a better health service? And I think that the, the member, I think he, he answers it partially. It is an ongoing uh, reform of that piece of work. In regards to the specific support that has been given to people with dementia. Uh, who are living in care homes and who are bore, bore the brunt, as the member rightly indicates, uh, of this pandemic as well. So it's about those additional supports and measures that we can put in place now, rather than waiting specifically on that piece of work completing in regards to strategies and implementation. So it's make, making sure, and we made sure, we were part of that initial vaccination group because of the, the exact specifics uh, that the member realises as they're more, they were more vulnerable uh, from the first wave when we saw that and acknowledged that. I call Martina Anderson. Last can call you. Uh, Minister, we have tragically seen that the, the makeup of those who have disproportionately died uh, from COVID have been those people who have suffered from, from dementia. So, and I'm conscious what you said, that it was an ongoing reform in the last question there when you answered that. But do you intend to bring forward plans to transform adult social care? And when will we get an opportunity to hear those plans here? Um, I, I think the member is well aware um, of my desire to make that change and to adult social care and our social care service across Northern Ireland. I, was in, I think I'm well on record 
uh, out of attendance at the health committee where he talked about it being the Cinderella service of our health service. One of the outworkings of this pandemic is to bring that workforce and, and the dedication and the work that they provide uh, into the limelight. It's my challenge as Minister to make sure that those people continue to receive uh, the recognition and the acknowledgement, uh, not just for the work they do, but also the commitment they give to the people that they look after as well. So, as I said to the previous member, this is an ongoing piece of work, but it's a piece of work that we want to get work right, and it's a piece of work that my, my chief social worker uh, is currently leading on so that we can progress that to make sure that it encapsulates not just what has happened in the pandemic, but the longer term benefits for our, our health and social care services. I call Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, given the pandemic, can the Minister provide an update on, on any plans on allowing care home residents, many of whom suffer from dementia, uh, access to family visits? And the member, um, the member raises you know, that point about the impact of, of restriction on visiting and on, on contact with families. And it has been recognised, uh, and the trusts are working in partnership now with families on care homes to ensure contact is being maintained between residents and relatives in line with regional visiting guidance. It remains my position that care home visiting and the subsequent implementation of the care partner role uh, is of critical importance to the health and well-being of care home residents, and in particular those with dementia. The care partner contact is in addition to visits uh, to a resident, which are, are organised according to the care home's visiting policy and the Department of Health's COVID-19 regional principles for visiting. However, the current Level 5 visiting restrictions should not prevent care partners from being permitted access to care homes. Care homes are being actively encouraged to adhere to all aspects of the revised visiting guidance, including the introduction of care partners and care partner contact can continue, providing that visits are aligned with the infection prevention and control measures. And in addition, my department is currently undertaking work to facilitate the testing of care partners as part of the care home staff testing programme. And trust will continue to engage with care homes to reinforce the care partner message. Um, key workers are also ins ensuring in family communications that they are aware of this role and offering support to families to help them set up the role uh, when that need is identified. Moving on, I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question four, please, Minister. Um, and again, I, I thank the member for, for his question. I fully appreciate that every patient should be able to avail of the best treatment that the health service can provide and in a timely manner. Waiting times were wholly unacceptable before COVID-19 and, regrettably, they will even be worse after it. After the first wave of the pandemic, I was clear that rebuilding services across all programmes of care, including outpatient services, needed to be a key priority of the health and social care system. To this end, trusts were required to publish rebuilding plans on a three-month rolling basis which set out plans to incrementally increase HSC activity. Even during a rising number of cases at the end of last year, those rebuilding efforts continued. And thanks to the huge efforts of staff during Phase 3, which was October to December of last year, our health service exceeded the projected activity for the number of outpatient appointments delivered at a regional level by 16 per cent. And as we emerge from the latest wave of this pandemic, the focus of health, the health service will continue to be on resettling all elective services, including outpatients, in an environment that is safe for both staff and for patients. The situation is extremely challenging. Our HSC trusts are working with clinicians and the Health and Social Care Board to prioritise the care needs of patients who have been referred into the HSC system and also to ensure that all available capacity, including within the independent sector, is utilised as effectively and equitably as across uh, the entire region. Reducing elective care waiting lists to an acceptable level will require significant and sustained investment and additional staffing. And I have made it clear that hospital waiting lists must be a major pr executive priority in 2021 and beyond. I call Alan Chambers. Deputy Speaker, and thank you for your uh, answer, Minister. Um, the redeployment of healthcare staff throughout the pandemic has been necessary to deal with the ongoing pressures of COVID-19, and I'd like to thank all healthcare staff for the tremendous work that they've been doing under horrible uh, circumstances. Can the Minister provide an update on his discussions with the Executive to secure more funding to deal with all waiting lists when the pandemic is finally over? I think the, the member will be aware that um, under New Decade, New Approach, the reduction of waiting lists was a priority uh, for the entirety of the executive. 
Uh, the current budget is out for consultation, so in regards to that and the support of those who need uh, that additional support that we will be seeking across additional staff, across additional capacity and also the utilise of the independent sector is welcome for, you know, for anybody who wants to feed into the public consultation response that is currently ongoing there to ensure that the voice of Northern Ireland is, is heard in regards to how our society wants also to address uh, what is an unacceptable long waiting list time uh, was so before COVID-19 and definitely will be after. Apologies, I omitted the original question or supplementary question, so I now call Harry Harvey. No problem, Mr Deputy Speaker. I know we'll have to look after our own, so <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, we we'll welcome the figures of COVID-related deaths having fallen for the third week in a row. Could the Minister assure us that services for cancer patients will be reinstated as soon as possible? Thank you. Um, and I, th I thank the member. Um, I I'm sure there was no bias intended there, because uh, I've often been at the, the bias of, 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 of the deputy speaker before, and it's usually in the other way around, rather than being uh, in my favour than not. But no, the, the member makes a very uh, important part, and it is about getting our health service back on to the delivery of the services that many of our healthcare professionals want to be back doing, because that's the professional services they provide is what they've trained for and it's the patients that they want to see back uh, in their theatres, on their operating tables and in their waiting rooms as well. So we are doing, we're about to publish and we're preparing another set of three monthly rebuilding plans, uh, which I hope, hope to publish in the very near future. And we'll do that once we see this continuing tra tra trajectory of a decrease of inpatients in our hospital system. Uh, but we also have to be cognizant that we have a workforce uh, that through the first wave of this pandemic kept on their feet due to adrenaline. They're now on their feet due to a dedication uh, to their patients and to their work colleagues as well. So we must always factor in uh, the well-being of our staff as well as we look to rebuild <coughs> as quickly as possible, but also support those staff who have been at the sharp end of this entire pandemic since it began at this time last year. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, in terms of... Um, how we rebuild after uh, the pandemic. Uh, uh, considerable sums of money have already been spent in the hospital estate, particularly, I think, in an answer to me, you said uh, some £4 million have been spent on White Abbey Hospital site in relation to the COVID recovery unit there. What is the future for something like that, and what contribution can that make uh, to patient services post-pandemic? You know, uh, and I thank the member, and I, I think one of the things that we have been I suppose careful in doing as well as at any large scale investments like the White Abbey facility that we've made are also future proofed as well. Because I think the member will be well aware, you know, all, all the talks of reforms and reviews uh, that have happened in the health service over the years have always been clear. It's about re restructuring services rather than closing buildings and closing hospitals. That's not what I'm about. And I think what we've seen during this pandemic that our current footprint is too, um, too much under pressure. It's been underutilised, it's been underfinanced for too long as well over the past 10 years. So when we've had the opportunity to rebuild and rejuvenate places like the White Abbey, it's about looking how we take it. Once we get through the current work that's doing on supporting COVID uh, patients through that rehabilitation phase, using allied health professionals, nurse-led professionals, about how we take that to the next step, should it be for orthopaedic uh, provision, should it be for the rehabilitation of stroke patients, you know, the bids that we currently have for the utilisation of that facility in the future, uh, you know, are welcome to see because people can see our people are, and our health service are looking to what the future brings, how we can utilise uh, the developments and progresses that we've actually had to make in the past 12 months, but actually utilise them for a better health service for the next step so we don't simply return to what we had this time last year. I call Liz Kimmins. Best can call and thank the Minister for his answers so far. The Minister will undoubtedly be aware that the HRC have been given leave to JR his failure to commission and fund abortion services which have been legislated for. In light of this, will the Minister uh, move to remedy the situation and ensure women have access to appropriate modern health services? Thank you. That clearly is beyond, well beyond the original question, but I pass the Minister if he wishes to comment. Um, I think the Deputy Speaker have never never ducked a question in here before. I'm not going to start now. Um, my department does not dispute that women in Northern Ireland are legally entitled to abortion services. The legal advice received by my department states that while the Abortion Northern Ireland Regulation 2020 
uh, do not require my department to commission the relevant services. Registered medical professionals can now terminate pregnancies lawfully. Such terminations subject to the regulations are to be carried out on health and social care premises. I think yesterday the Deputy First Minister has stated that is, that is her opinion that it is my legal responsibility as Health Minister to make available the services to which women have a legal right. I am satisfied that I have ex executed my duty as Health Minister by bringing this matter under the terms of the Ministerial Code to the Executive to discuss and agree. I stand by my view that the Commission of Abortion Services could be considered as significant or controversial and outside the scope of the programme for government. The Commission of this service would also seem to uh, cut across the human rights responsibilities of the First and Deputy First Minister. In view of this, I am obliged under the Ministerial Code to bring this matter to the Executive to discuss and agree before the matter can proceed. In order to get uh, the position where my department could issue a commission in direction, as the Deputy First Minister is aware, and in furtherance to, of legal advice, I brought a paper for discussion to the Executive on 3 April 2020, uh, providing options for the establishment of an early medical abortion service in Northern Ireland during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as yet, no decision has been taken by the Executive, and therefore there is no commission service for abortion in Northern Ireland. I call George Robinson. And five, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, I, I, I thank the member uh, for, for, his, for his question. Um, as of uh, close of play yesterday, um, 499,206 uh, vaccines have been delivered in Northern Ireland, so just shy of half a, half a, half a million. Uh, that is uh, 468,000 uh, people have received their first uh, vaccine. 95% uh, of over 80s have received the vaccination, 90% of over 75s, 84% of over 70s, and 69% of 65s. As the member may be aware, we have now moved in uh, to the groups uh, who are clinically extremely vulnerable and also uh, carers. These figures are a testament to the effective work of both GPs and trusts in deploying the vaccine as rapidly as possible. It is hoped in line with the commitment in other parts of the UK that the vaccination programme will have been open to all ad adults uh, over 50 by the 15th of April and open to all the population by the end of July. The long-term success of the programme depends on achieving high uptake rates in all sections of the adult community, and therefore every effort will be made to ensure the programme continues to be rolled out rapidly. The main variable impact on vaccination of the population is the availability of vaccine, and it is hoped vaccine supply will increase, and this combined with strong uptake of the offer of vaccination among the population should help the rate of vaccina vaccinations rise. The rate increase should also be assisted by the opening of an additional mass vaccination centre at the SSE arena, which we hope will become operational in April. With the focus firmly on protecting those most at risk from the virus, the programme has expanded to cover everyone aged 65 and over and those who are clinically extremely vulnerable to COVID-19 carers and the clinically vulnerable. That is priority groups 1 to 6. Uh, Trust Mobile and Roving Teams will focus on those groups for whom travel to a vaccination centre would be challenging, such as the elderly and care home residents or a supported living centre where the clinical risk was considered to be similar to a care home. Again, the programme is entirely dependent on the supply of vaccine, but rapid progress has been made and the vaccine has been offered to those in priority groups 1 to 5 and was now being extended to those in groups priority 6, and that should be completed in March. All care homes have been visited uh, once the, the minister and the residents time. and staff vaccinated with the first dose, while 99 per cent of the homes have already received their second visit to deliver the second doses. And I think I prove I get no favour in this House. Can I remind the Minister, if he wishes to uh, have an extra minute for a particular question, he, he can request so. I call George Robinson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr <coughs> Deputy Chair, and thank the Minister for his answer as well. Would the Minister agree that the vaccination programme is central to tackling the COVID-19 pandemic and fully reopening the economy? And uh, what impact has the, va the vaccine rollout made to your elderly patients and residents in our care homes throughout Northern Ireland? Now, you may have answered that question in the last question. <laughs> so I, I, I think I might have touched on the, on the last piece, Mr Robinson, but just, I, I suppose one point we need to be 
be, be clear of as well. And we are seeing the early shoots um, of the, the benefits that this vaccine programme will bring. We have often talked about it being the light um, during these very dark days of the pandemic, but what I would caution members is while we are seeing good numbers, while we are seeing the uptakes, uh, we are just about to start into the second doses of people receiving the vaccine. So I would caution that we do not take those rays of hope and extinguish them too quickly by trying to rush out of the restrictions and the regulations that we are currently in, because it will be a balance of the benefits the vaccination brings also managed uh, with regulations and restrictions until we see the greater vaccination of the entirety of the population um, of Northern Ireland. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And can I advise members that question number three has been withdrawn? And I now call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, um, you will recognise that community pharmacies across Northern Ireland have been instrumental uh, in responding to COVID, only made possible due to the significant additional investment that you made and identified uh, for the sector in 2021. So, can you tell the House what provisions you have made in the budget for community pharmacy funding for 2021-22, given that COVID is still here and that community pharmacies uh, teams continue to face many challenges? Um, and again, I, I thank the member and I thank him for his acknowledgement for the work that community, community pharmacy uh, has done. And, and, I, and I think, in regards to the engagement that we as a department have, have, have had, uh, led by my chief pharmacy, in regards to the working relationship uh, that we now have, community pharmacy, uh, because my department has worked with them, uh, who are their body, uh, to, in the development actually of a commissioning plan uh, for services up until March 2021. The plan had focused on the provision of services to the public during the coronavirus pandemic to ensure access to medicines during this time, including the funding and commissioning of the prescription delivery service uh, for certain patients. And it is my intention, uh, and it is the intention of my department, to continue that work with uh, Community Pharmacy in Northern Ireland to negotiate a new commissioning document and roadmap for the delivery of services during 2021-22 and beyond which will be developed further in due course uh, once we are over the, the, the current pandemic. But as I also made clear to, to the member in an earlier or was, was to, to made clear to the House, uh, we are currently in that public consultation in regards to the budget. So there have been bids made for many things. And I recognise the work the community pharmacy has, has done and continues to make. Um, they are part of that, that funding process that we are in. We are in a draft budget situation for, um, and I am sure the member has been lobbied by members of the community pharmacy to raise this subject, but I would also encourage him and them to feed into the public consultation as well. So it is not just my voice asking for monies and support for them, but also that voice has gone through to the Minister of Finance as well about the support that my department needs to support community pharmacy. I call Stuart Dixon for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. And I really appreciate the answer which the Minister has given us. The uh, Minister will recognise that community pharmacies um, have a great deal of public confidence in them. They are quite often the local shop and the place where many people will go to to get health advice. They will also be places where people can and do get vaccinated for the flu vaccine. What plans do you have, Minister, to, to allow community pharmacies to roll out the COVID vaccine as things move forward in this pandemic, because people will have confidence in having that service delivered in that setting. Um, our, community, our community pharmacy partners are part of that uh, future, future proofing of our vaccine when we get into the larger population scale. What they are currently doing is, is completing some of the flu vaccines for the, for the younger age cohorts, cohorts that we have not done previously in the past. Uh, and we appreciate their support in doing that because as community pharmacy have been able uh, to concentrate on the delivery of the flu vaccine, it has allowed us to develop our regional uh, centres for COVID vaccines and allowed our GPs uh, to concentrate on those who need the COVID vaccine that they can easily identify. So it is about working in partnership and we've, I, I think we have a very strong working uh, relationship now with community pharmacy, which maybe uh, in the past the, the department did not have. I uh, Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, grateful uh, if the Minister could update the House on his consultation on the mental health strategy. Um, I, I thank the, the member for, for his topic, and I know it is something that is, is deep to his heart. I think, um, from my recollection and from being in this House, uh, mental health was never talked about until he raised it on the floor and made it a topic of conversation, not just here, um, but across uh, elected bodies and elected representatives. Um, across these islands. 
On the 21st of December 2020, I published the draft mental health strategy for public consultation. Uh, this was a hugely important step forward as it will set the strategic direction for mental health in Northern Ireland for the next decade and beyond. The draft strategy was produced thanks to a coordinated effort from many people with lived experience and from across different organisations and sectors. The creation of a new mental health strategy that puts the needs of the individual at the centre uh, that respects diversity and equality and that supports emotional well-being and positive mental health is of paramount importance to our communities. To date, we have held three large-scale virtual events with over 90 participants attending each, and over the coming weeks the Department is holding a number of small theme consultation meetings to provide an opportunity for individuals to virtually meet with my officials to discuss specific aspects of the draft strategy in more detail. And the consultation, as the member will be aware, is due to close on the 26th of March. So I would encourage anyone with an interest in mental health uh, to engage and share their views. I call Mike Nesbitt. I thank the Minister. Delighted the strategy consultation is underway and being so well received. Uh, Minister, last Thursday you recorded a message for the Northern Ireland Youth Forum uh, for the launch of their mental health toolkit, an event which MLA Chris Little and I were, uh, were honoured to attend. Could I encourage you to share that toolkit with your uh, executive colleague, the Minister for Education, for favour of distribution to Northern Ireland's schools? Um, um, certainly, um, because I think the engagement that, that we have had um, through the Mental Health, um, Wellbeing, Resilience and Suicide Prevention Subcommittee of the Executive has engaged, it is engaged with, and I think it was in the back of Mr Little's recommendations, we engaged with the group Elephant in the Room, which was very productive and led to subsequent meetings with other, other ministers as well. So the sharing of that document throughout the Executive uh, and asking our Education Minister to share it also with all schools, but also maybe the, the Minister for the Economy so that she can share it with universities and further education colleges as well to make sure that we get what is an excellent uh, co-produced document as widely shared as much as possible. It will be a benefit, I think, not just from us as a department, but from the young people who are engaged in the production of it, but also with the young people who are in receipt of it as well. And they do, do need that help or the guidance that is contained in the document. Yeah. Patsy McGlone is not in this place. I call William Irwin. To the Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister with the obvious pressures mounting around the need to get our children back to school and to into the classroom as soon as possible, what plans does the Minister to vaccinate staff or in our schools as a priority? Um, the member will be aware, and I have said this uh, on, on a number of occasions, uh, we are following the, the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation Guidance, which uh, assesses by risk in regards to mortality and also um, the implication that it will have should, should the individual within that cohort actually contact COVID-19. So I will be sticking uh, by that JCVI recommendation, which is by uh, age profile, uh, by clinical profile. Uh, I am aware that there is a piece of work going on within JCVI looking at specific occupational cohorts that may be at um, more risk, uh, but as of yet we have not received any further update. And until I do and receive further guidance from JCVI, JCVI, uh, I will be maintaining and sticking to the current guidance that we have, we have to date because it has worked for us so far in regards to where we see the decrease um, in the number of infections in our care homes, the number of infections in society, uh, but also the decrease in uh, the number of hospitalisations that we are also seeing. I call William Irwin. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for his response? The Minister accept that uh, uh, there are many working in, in in, in, in the essential uh, jobs, such as the agri-food sector, that have worked right through the pandemic, and um, you know, I, I, they should be a priority in this situation. Um, I, I, and I think the member, you know, he, he moved, um, and I think from from teachers to those in the agri-food sector, and I think the member himself demonstrates the difficulty. And once you start to identify the importance of one section. Uh, of a workforce, it very easily expands. So that is why we are concentrating on the JCVI guidance as to vaccinating people uh, in, in priority of risk uh, so that we actually save lives uh, and prevent serious uh, illness as well. The member may, may or not be aware, but we have put in supported testing facilities uh, in some of our agri-food factor, factories across Northern Ireland, supported by uh, the Department of Health and Social Care in England as well. So, as, as opposed to simply vaccinating uh, certain sectors, we can also support uh, by increased testing as well in certain sectors. I call Paul Bradley. 
Speaker. Um, Minister, I wonder, could you give us an update on um, the, the lack of addiction services that we have within the community, especially with those with a dual diagnosis? And I thank the member. It is a, it, 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 well, the dual diagnosis piece has been a significant challenge um, for, for the department and the provision of mental health supports that we do have uh, over a number of years, because often people with a dual diagnosis were either been seen by one speciality or the other, but never that holistic approach. So as part of the mental health strategy, there is work about how we actually produce uh, not a mental, not, not a dual diagnosis specific cohort of workforce, but how we make sure that any mental health provision is person centric, so that no matter what they're presenting with, no matter what their diagnosis is, they're getting the support that they need when they need it, where they need it, which is more important than than, than creating another service. But it's all part of the mental health strategy uh, and the consultation that's out there at the moment. So I would encourage the member to get involved uh, with that and also organisations that you may be aware of, so we can really highlight the need for increased mental health services in Northern Ireland. I call Paula Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Just to follow on from that, um, I know you're aware that the Committee for Communities is looking at the licensing and registration of clubs bill, and I know that we have written to you and you have responded, but just if you get an update on the um, minimum unit pricing of alcohol as well. Um, again, this, this, this is a piece of work, and, and we've actually engaged with the, the government of, of the Irish Republic in regards to this, so that we are coming forward, not at the same time, but as closely as possible because there is a thought process that if there's a minimum, unit, unit, minimum price for a unit of alcohol in the Republic of Ireland and we're not doing something similar uh, in Northern Ireland that will simply encourage cross-border trade, it would be my intention that we do go out to consultation um, at the end um, of this mandate. I don't think we have the scope. Uh, I'll, be, I'll, be cl I'll be clear to the member that I don't think that, that we have the scope within this current mandate, either within capacity within my own department or the time necessary to bring it forward in a meaningful way, but I would be intent that we do go out to consultation so that whoever comes into to this role in the next mandate already has that piece of preparatory work all, already done. I call Robin Newton. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister will be aware from the discussions this morning on the health regs that I think probably every speaker uh, expressed concern about the mental health of pupils as they return to school. Can I ask the Minister, is he engaging in any specific way about the mental health of the pupils as they return to school and being prepared to put into place any actions to help deliver that return safely? Um, and again, I think the Member, and again, I th he highlights one of those, those gaps that has often been underfunded within our service, not even the support of the mental health um, for, for young people through CAMS. And I know it's something the member has, has championed and worked, um, worked for in dedication with his own, and within his own constituency in the past in regards to the lack of provision and, and the more need and more support that is actually there. So the, the, the support that we have uh, for our pupils and also for the staff has been in conjunction with the, the Department of Education and the Education Minister is a co-funded project uh, coming forward for that specific uh, task, so we can tackle it as well. But what I would say in the earlier debate, the member referred to uh, my department coming together with the Department of Education, Department of Communities, about looking at to, to a, hol a holistic support mechanism uh, for children, even going into the school summer holidays as well, or even over the Easter break as well. If possible, that's something that I'd be keen to progress, and I know it's something that our mental health champion has also brought to the fore as well as that greater piece of work that once the school term ends, there are still additional supports there as well for those children who need it. Call Rob Newton for supplementary. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome what the, the Minister has said, and I know that I'm not alone in this uh, in terms of the members of the Education Committee, but perhaps the Minister would devote particular attention to those 2,000-odd children who are at risk and are safer, perhaps, in school than they are in their own home as the schools return to, hopefully, what we regard as normal. No, and I, I think the member makes that point because, as I say, it's, I know it's something of personal interest to him, uh, and I think it was highlighted in the debate earlier on in regards to the additional number of children we've actually seen taken into care in the past year as well. So, as, a, as the corporate parent for the, those children, it is a concern to me to make sure that the supports are there, but also there is a way of identifying those children who do most need 
uh, that additional support, but the mechanisms are also there through my department, supported by the Department of Education, and a collaborative approach to support our young people. And that is the end of our period of time of questions to the Health Minister. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments before the next side of the business, which is a return to the debate on the, uh, on the, what, the uh, health protection regulations.